A reading from the second book of Maccabees. It happened that seven brothers with their mother were arrested and tortured with whips and scourges by the king to force them to eat pork in violation of God's law. One of the brothers, speaking for the others, said, What do you expect to achieve by questioning us? We are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. At the point of death, he said, You accursed fiend, you are depriving us of this present life, but the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. It is for his laws that we are dying. After him, the third suffered their cruel sport. He put out his tongue at once when told to do so, and bravely held out his hands as he spoke these noble words. It was for heaven that I received these. For the sake of his laws, I disdain them. From him, I hope to receive them again. Even the king and his attendants marveled at the young man's courage because he regarded his sufferings as nothing. After he had died, they tortured and maltreated the fourth brother in the same way. When he was near death, he said, It is my choice to die at the hands of men, with the hope God gives of being raised up by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. The Word of the Lord. Our first reading for this Sunday is taken from the second book of Maccabees. We would like to reflect on the beauty of the teaching of the church regarding life after death. Many people will probably find this quite irrelevant nowadays. They will say, well, we have to focus on this life. And that is true. But what happens to our involvement in this life if there is no vision of life after death. In the first reading, we find this uh, episode in the life of Israel, which was quite uh, dark because of the persecution of the Israelites. It was a religious persecution. The Israelites were being asked against their will and against the commandment of the Lord to eat forbidden food, most especially pork, which, according to uh, the Jewish tradition, rendered people uh, ritually impure because they considered pigs as impure animals. So if you eat of, this, uh, of the flesh of these uh, animals, then you also become impure. And so you need to be cleansed before you could join worship and offer sacrifice to the Lord. Now, this is being forced on the Israelites. One element of a general persecution. In the passage today, we hear of the account of the persecution and the martyrdom of seven brothers, four of them, who would rather die rather than violate the commandments of the Lord. Many of us would probably say, wow, it's just about rules. It's just about uh, some sort of a dietary uh, restriction. Why will they not taste it and then save their lives? Why not be practical? Well, for them, this is not just about eating something or not eating something. This is about their fidelity to God. It is not so much a rule. It is more about a relationship with God. And keeping the rule means that they recognize God. And they would go, go through anything. They will bear anything just to keep the relationship with God. Just to maintain the relationship with God. What sustained these brothers in the face of persecution? 
there must be something. For every persecution is uh, uh, quite painful. Who will not, who will not tremble before the weapons of death before you? Especially if you see one person dying and you're the next to be persecuted. In the account of the four mar martyrs, the four brothers who were martyred, what sustained them? Is this, the hope in life after death. They believed that God created them. Life is a gift of God, for God is life. And if life comes from God, God can restore life after death. This is the belief of these brothers. And this belief made them courageous. They will not deny God who gave them life. And they could face the physical persecution in this world in the hope that in the afterlife, God who is life, will give life again. So people who say, oh, the belief in the life after death is useless, they better read this text. And they will see how this faith could give courage, could give hope, could give people who believe in life after death as a gift of God who is life, as a continuing process of creation, as it were, from creation in this world to a recreation in eternal life, you will see that this faith could make a person a mountain, a mountain of strength that even kings, emperors, and soldiers would marvel at the courage of one of these sons of this valiant woman. They, they, they were the ones who trembled. Why is this person courageous in the face of death? What makes a person face and bear difficulties in this life? The promise of a life after death coming from the God who is life. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting encouragement and good hope through his grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen them in every good deed and word. Finally, brothers and sisters, Pray for us, so that the word of the Lord may speed forward and be glorified, as it did among you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and wicked people, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. We are confident of you in the Lord that what we instruct you, you are doing and will continue to do. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the endurance of Christ. The Word of the Lord. Our second reading for this Sunday is taken from the second letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. We have been reflecting on the beauty of our belief in life after death. And we saw how this conviction of faith has sustained the seven brothers uh, who were martyred in the first reading, uh, according to the second book of Maccabees. How this faith in the life after death sustained them to uh, face persecution and to be faithful to God. Now, in the second reading, we find uh, another situation 
the Thessalonians were expecting the second coming of Jesus Christ to be imminent, to happen soon. So they were, they had no problems with uh, uh, their faith in not only life after death, but in the fulfillment of history, what we call the second coming of the Lord. And they were not afraid of the second coming of God in Jesus Christ. They were not afraid uh, for uh, in the coming of the restoration of God's kingdom, full restoration in the, the definitive kingdom here on earth, in the afterlife even. They were awaiting it with eagerness, with anticipation, quite different uh, from our attitudes now. When people nowadays talk about the second coming of the Lord, we, we normally say, oh, not, not too soon, not too soon. But the Thessalonians were eager they, they, to welcome him. They said, come, Lord Jesus, come. And so when Jesus' second coming did not happen as they had expected, they were quite disappointed. They were upset. They probably uh, longed to be still alive here on earth when this second coming occurred. And so the second reading was an occasion for St. Paul to remind them of life here on earth as we anticipate life after death. St. Paul reminds them to be constant in their good works here on earth while waiting for the coming of the Lord. He reminds them to be faithful, especially in their thoughts, holy and good thoughts, as they await the coming of the Lord. They should also be vigilant. They should not allow themselves to be swayed by false teaching coming from evil people. St. Paul also reminds them to guard themselves so that they would not be tempted. They would not fall into the evils being presented to them by the contemporary world. They have to rely on the strength that comes from the Lord. And all of this should happen now, here on earth. St. Paul is giving us the other side of our faith regarding the life after death. Faith in uh, belief in life after death should not distract us from living our faith fully here on earth. It is not an either-or choice. Our belief in the afterlife does not mean we will waste our life here on earth, especially our life of faith. No. Do good. Think good thoughts. Avoid evil. Be vigilant here on earth as a preparation for your life after death. So this is a good a completion of the picture. Life after death and life here on earth are interconnected, even if they may be qualitatively different, but they are interconnected. We should avoid falling into two extremes. One extreme denies life after death, and so life is restricted to this earth. That is one temptation that we should avoid. The other temptation is to be so narrowly focused on life after death that we do not see any value in life here on earth and in history. So with the first and second readings, we have a fuller vision of faith in God lived here on earth with anticipation for the life after death.
the proclamation of the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, came forward and put this question to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, If someone's brother dies leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman but died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And likewise, all the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now, at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and remarry. But those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like angels, and they are the children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush, when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. The Gospel of the Lord. Our Gospel passage for this Sunday is taken from St. Luke. We have been reflecting on the beauty and the value of our belief in life after death. We see how in the first reading, the seven brothers who were persecuted because of their defiance of the, the king's order for them to eat, food that is forbidden by the law of God, how their faith in the life after death sustained them in courage, in hope. They knew that God, who is the source of life, will restore life as an act of justice. But in the second reading, we find St. Paul reminding the Thessalonians who were quite upset that the second coming of the Lord did not happen so soon as they had expected. They had to live their lives here on earth fully. Expecting the coming of the Lord and belief in the life after death are not an excuse to waste time and life and energy here on earth. We should live fully here on earth as we await the resurrection that will happen after death. In the Gospel, we find a group of people in a way testing Jesus, the so-called Sadducees. During the time of Christ, not all the Israelites believed in life after death as what as we believe in it, the resurrection of the dead. And one such group that did not believe in the resurrection of the dead was the Sadducees. And they confronted Jesus, you know, uh, and in this regard, the Jesus, Jesus held the position of the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. What did the Sadducees believe in? Well, just like the many other Israelites during that time, they believe that when somebody dies, this person goes to the place of the dead called Shaul. Shaul. And in Shaul, the dead people you know, continued to exist in the form of non-existence. <laughs> Quite confusing. Huh? They don't exist, but they exist as some, someone who does not exist. That's why they were called the shades, shades. But the deeper truth is this. In the place of the dead, they lived a life which was not life at all. Why? Because in the place of the dead, there was no more communication with God. For God is a God of life. And so God could not be present 
in the place of the dead. So the place of the dead could not be penetrated by God according to them. So there in Shaul, the dead lived as dead without any communion with God and with other people. And so the death is a, in a way a condemnation. You will be forever, ever isolated from God and from other persons. No possibility of life after death in the form of restoration of life, resurrection. But Jesus counters them. They fabricated a, a, a story of a woman who was widowed. And in, in compliance with the law of Moses, this woman was taken as a wife by the second brother of the former husband. And as the story goes, all of them died. And so this woman became the wife of seven brothers. And all of them died. Now, the question of the Sadducees was uh, in the resurrection of the dead, if there is, if there were <laughs> a, a resurrection of the dead, whose wife will she be? Remember, she became the wife of seven brothers. This became an occasion for Jesus to affirm what we should believe in regarding life after death. The first thing is, Jesus affirmed that God is the God of the living. The source of life is the restorer of life. And for God, all are alive. All are alive for God. And so even the place of death, even death, could be conquered by God. God and the life of God are stronger than the powers of death. That's why we should not inflict death. For that is not the way of God. We should respect life because life comes from God. And those who destroy life are answerable to the author of life, God, for whom all are alive. The second foundation of our belief in the resurrection of the dead is Jesus' answer to the Sadducees. He says, in the resurrection of the dead, this woman will not be given to marriage to any of those seven brothers. Here on earth, you propagate life by marriage. But in the resurrection of the dead, that is a different type of life. So, my dear brothers and sisters, when we say the afterlife, when we talk about the resurrection from the dead, we should not think of it as a return to the normal life here on earth, back to eating, back to drinking, back to uh, corruption, back to evil, and back to death. No. When we say restoration to life, resurrection from the dead, it is not a return to the life or here on earth that we are used to. It is rather an entry into the life of God. They will live in God. And because they will be living in God, there is no more possibility of dying. No more death. So it is a totally different type of living. It is a totally different type of existence because it is existence in God. And in some sense, if we relate this to the experience of the martyrs in the first reading, the resurrection of the dead is an act of God's justice, telling those who destroy life here on earth, 
telling those who persecute others that they are powerless before God. God will have the last word. God's life will triumph. And God will even correct what is violated here on earth. So my dear brothers and sisters, while living here on earth, let us already practice life after death. Continue living fully our life here on earth. As St. Paul tells the Thessalonians in the second reading, but let us live life here on earth with eyes also focused on the life after death. Meaning, whatever you're doing here on earth, let everything be done in God and for God. In that way, we will already be having a foretaste of life after death here on earth. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful way of blending life here on earth with our feet firmly grounded here uh, in our history, in our time, yet we are anticipating life in God promised to us as resurrection from the dead. You know, as a priest, uh, I, I am called to uh, administer the uh, sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And it pains me to see some people you know, facing death, facing their last moments, and uh, lacking the serenity of someone who welcomes the coming of God, who is life, and who would give him or her life beyond our world. You feel some sort of heaviness when the belief in the afterlife is not present. But when it happens, when it is proclaimed, you, you see tremendous joy, not only in the others, but also in you. I remember uh, having taken care of uh, some people afflicted with HIV AIDS and coming to the close of their lives and how they would console one another. I remember one person afflicted with HIV visiting someone who was close to death saying, please tell Jesus we love him. Please tell Jesus, when you meet Jesus, tell him how much we love him. And you could see how even the pains and the humiliation of this earth could be healed in a new life in Jesus. And it is a, a consolation to us who will have to continue facing the trials and the tribulations of life here on earth. This belief is beautiful. It gives us strength. It gives us hope. It gives us reason to live fully here on earth. The word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it.